So Chris is going to lead us in a song to get us in, um, engaged in a bodily way uh, in a conversation. All right, my friends. Is this a... Uh... Is this microphone working here? Yeah. Oh, that's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing. You gotta start with the basics. Is the microphone working? And then you can start talking about how we're gonna end white supremacy. We'll, go from, we'll start with the basics and then we'll go there. So, so first of all, first of all, it's beautiful to be in a room with a bunch of people who want to work for racial justice and end this nightmare. Does that feel good to you all to end yeah. this nightmare? Yes. Is that who's here in this room? Yes. All right, so we gotta warm ourselves up because it's cold out there and it's cold in this political environment. So I invite you to join me in rising in body or spirit to, to, to stand if you are willing or to just raise your spirit in the energy because we are going to sing a call and response song. And I am influenced by the Southern Freedom Movement. This is a song from the Highlander Center that I was taught by Unitarian Universalist Delandria Williams and Tafara Waller Muhammad, who is a cultural organizer in Arkansas. And we're gonna do a call and response song. This is an important song has been used for centuries to help build people power and bring us together. It's not about a performance necessarily. In this moment, it's about generating a sense of us as a people as a people of commitment to our values, as a people who are committed to getting free. Does that sound good? Yeah. yeah. So we're gonna do call and response. And the first time, it's always a little awkward, so don't worry, it's gonna, it's gonna be a little awkward. You're gonna be like, wait, what am I doing? And I don't even really wanna sing. Why am I even standing up here to begin with? So here we go. We're gonna do the first one and just be in your own self about just, oh my gosh, why are we doing this? And then the second time around, the third time around, the third time around, we're gonna be like, Wow, it sounds like we've been working together for a whole year. We'll see how it goes. We'll see how it goes. <laughs> the first time, first time. So join me. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna sing, and 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 you know, you're gonna hear my voice, and you're gonna be like, well, I can do better than that. So you're all good. <laughs> so we're gonna sing. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna sing here, and you're gonna respond. Y'all with me? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. So it goes like this. Solid as a rock. Solid as a rock. Rooted as a tree. Rooted as a tree, I am here. I am here, standing tall. Standing tall in my rightful place. In my rightful place. All right, second time around. Solid as a rock. Solid as a rock. Rooted as a tree. Rooted as a tree, I am here. I am here, standing tall. Standing tall in my rightful place. In my rightful place. All right, y'all. Now we're gonna really just bring it all in here. So we're gonna be a community of people here this third time around. Y'all ready? All right. Solid as a rock. Solid as a rock. Rooted as a tree. Rooted as a tree, I am here. I am here, standing tall. Standing tall in my rightful place. In my rightful place. All right, beautiful people. Now we're in our rightful place together here. You feeling ready? Yes. Good. Um, so Judy and Chris and I had a. Preparatory conversation, and after that preparatory conversation, at the end of it, I said, "Well, if that's all we do, it'll be quite a phenomenal event." It was really fun to prepare for this, um, and a lot of the questions and the topics that we're going to talk about tonight um, came from that conversation. So we're going to start with this time and this moment, this political moment. Um, what's at stake now? Um, what are the risks? right now in this political moment? What are the possibilities? And are we looking at end times or an opening for us now to build something entirely new? Are we looking at end times? Wow. Um, there's a couple of things. There's a, there are a couple of quotes that sort of govern how I look at the world. And um, one of them is from Lila Watson, who's an Aboriginal activist. And she says, um, if you've come here to help me, you're wasting your time. But if, you're, but if you've come here because your liberation is bound up with mine, then let us work together. And the other one is Audre Lorde's, um, none of us lead single issue lives, therefore there can be no such thing as a single issue struggle, right? And then the last one I'm gonna share is um, one of my favorite quotes from The Matrix, which is Morpheus to Neo. <laughs> 
Mm -hmm. who says to, Morpheus says to Neo, this is your last chance. After this, there is no turning back. You take the blue pill, the story ends, you wake up in your bed and believe whatever you want to believe. You take the red pill, you stay in Wonderland, and I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. And I think what we're seeing is how deep the rabbit hole goes, right? Um, if you really think about it, it took us over 400 years to get a first black president who had to be the most educated human being possible, <laughs> the most respectable human being possible, the most perfect family possible in order to be president. And then we turned around eight years later and put into office the dumbest man in America, right? right. With, and when you look at that, that's how white supremacy operates, right? Because it's okay to be mediocre if you're white. If you are a person of color, you have to be extraordinary. So I don't think this is anything new, but I think we're starting to unveil um, the 400-year-old elephant in the room that none of us have ever wanted to talk about. And if you really want to explore the whole idea of end times, I mean, this this whole idea of the holy, the fall of the Holy Roman Empire, right? There's a you can be a powerful entity, but at some point there's going to be a crash. And I think this is what we're starting to witness. Yeah, I mean, just continuing with the tales, Adrian Murray Brown, you know, incredible visionary writer, black, you know, black liberation leader. You know, she talks about how in these times, it's not that things haven't been bad before, but the veils keep coming down over and over and over again. And that we need to be able to hold each other and love each other enough to be able to stay present to what is happening and to be able to fight back and also be able to maintain our humanity to imagine alternative futures and alternative politics that don't just resist what is, but help us build what it is we want. And so I think that's part of this time is there is so much to be fighting back against <clears throat> and to hold on to what is it that we are working to build and to be working as much as possible to shift culture to shift our politics in ways that are visionary, especially in these times when literally hundreds of thousands of people have been politicized by the election and have come into political involvement, whether that's in electoral campaigns, whether that's in uh, grassroots groups like you know Indivisible that have, that have risen up, whether that's in uh, the surge in, in membership of existing organizations and in progressive faith communities. Um, and so being able to hold new people who are understandably pissed off and want to do as much as they possibly can right now to end the nightmare to help people be long distance runners in a culture that sustains and nourishes them to be in this work beyond burnout, beyond fatigue, and to help become revolutionaries, not just reactionaries in this political economy. I also think that um, this time is really sort of calling us to look internally What's the internal work that we're doing? Um, you know, it's easy enough to put it, push externally and say, oh, that's the enemy, that the enemy are those people out there, the Trump voters, Trump. <clears throat> and the truth is, we have to look at what their actions are and work against it. But a lot of times we, have, we need to unpack internally what white domination, white supremacy has done to all of us whether you're white or whether you're a person of color, whether you've internalized the oppression to believe in white superiority, or if you've been programmed to believe you're superior. So I think really, to me, this moment is about how do we look at the, in, how do we look at the external things, but make them reflect internally on the work we need to do. Great, thank you. Um, I don't think I'm gonna have anything <laughs> yet. Um, so let's talk about the sickness of white supremacy. Um, what does it do to people of color? What does it do to white people? And, and what are the manifestations and consequences politically, environmentally, and internally in our hearts and in our minds? Excuse me, can I suggest turning down the mic or something? It's really hard. Sure. It's lovely, it's lovely yours. I know. <laughs> the Quakers is always so loud. <laughs> is that better? No. It's still echoey. Yours is super loud. Yeah. 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 Is that better? Yes. 
All right. So for me, thinking about white supremacy, so the work that I do is primarily working to help support white communities, white leaders, mostly white institutions, organizations, faith communities, the white folks to help develop the capacity, the commitment, the values, the vision for white people to want to end white supremacy. Not only because of white supremacy being a nightmare in the lives of communities of color, but also the ways that white supremacy is a nightmare in the lives of white communities. And white supremacy, from the beginning, was used as a way to divide European indentured servants, European American working class and poor people from the lives, the humanity, the dignity of people of color. To fundamentally create a white culture that is at its heart, not white people biologically, but a white culture, a white supremacist mentality that is fundamentally based in a anti-black racism, in a anti-people of color's humanity, and in a white superiority. And so white culture is fundamentally rooted in that commitment because that's why white culture was developed, to be able to separate indentured Europeans and working class what, who became white people from being able to see people of color as family, as community, as friends, as comrades, as allies, in working for economic justice, and working to overturn slave society, and working to transform unjust institutions and economic situations into ones that could benefit all of us. To also prevent indentured Europeans and working class Europeans from joining indigenous communities in this country and fleeing the violent, hierarchical, European colonial societies that were being established here. So it was fundamentally to prevent working class and poor European becoming American people from joining with spiritually, politically, you know, as family, solidarity and struggle with people of color. And so in order to do that, in order to turn European Americans into people who either resent, despise, or see people of color as threats or uh, criminals or whatever it is, you also have to start to begin to detach European Americans from their own, from our own hearts, from our own sense of, as European Americans, our own sense, for those of us who've been raised white, of our own humanity that is able to see the humanity of other people. So we have to deform our own humanity, our own hearts, our own souls, to be able to then be soldiers of a white, soldiers consciously or unconsciously, liberal racists or conservative racists. But people who are enacting white supremacist worldviews, whether that is through paternalism or a savior mentality, or that is a neo-Nazi alt-right mentality, but a, people of color are unable to live and govern themselves, people of color are unable to be productive, uh, people of color are unable, 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 unable and that white people must take care of them, white people must exploit them, white people must imprison them, on and on and on and on. And so the harm of white supremacy in white communities is turning white communities into either bases of active support for the violence, the horror of racism, and also turning white people into, again, conscious or unconscious soldiers that inflict that violence on communities of color. And that violence then also comes out within, the, within white families, within white communities, within white people against themselves. I mean, the suicide rates, the drug addiction rates, the alcohol rates, the violence rates in white communities is deeply connected to a white supremacist anti-humanity of all of us an anti-humanity of all of us that is all about maintaining profit and power at the very top and getting the vast majority of us to live in a culture of despair, a culture of pointing fingers and hating each other. And so the nightmare has to end in all of our communities. It looks different in our communities. I'm not trying to say it's all the same and white communities are you know, uh, the, the same level of experience of racism, but nonetheless, to get white people to engage in the work to end white supremacy, not from a we wanna save those people of color from racism, but from a, this is a nightmare that is devastating all of our lives, and we have to end it. I do not want to be a part of a culture that kills Trayvon Martin. I do not want to be a part of a culture that kills Freddie Gray. I do not want to be a part of this culture anymore. And so being able to rise up against it for all of us. Yeah, that's a lot. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, I. 
I think, you know, it's always instructive to sort of look at our own stories, so I'm going to share a story. Um, so, I do anti-racism work, I do or deep, you know, deep relational organizing. Um, I've been doing this stuff for quite a while, and so um, a couple years ago, I was in Lincoln Center, and I was meeting a friend. And uh, I had been there all day because uh, my ex-boyfriend ran Lincoln Center out of doors, and he had a show, and I was backstage, and it was all lovely, and then the show broke down, and by the time my friend called me, it was like 11-ish, and the plaza had cleared out. And so I started, he calls me, he says, I'm in the subway, just meet me downstairs. So I start walking downstairs, and a young black man in a hoodie with a duffel bag starts walking towards me. And my stomach starts doing this dance, this like topsy-turvy twist that it was doing, like danger, danger, Will Robinson, danger, right? And I had to, A, check myself, go, holy shit, I'm scared, why am I scared? Mm -hmm. uh, and to inter inter interrogate myself, what's going on, what's happening? And the whole time that this is happening, I'm still walking. And I'm walking towards him intentionally because I'm like, oh my God, this is, this is white supremacy, right? And so I, and we made eye contact. And I knew he knew. And I knew I wasn't the first person who had done that to him. And I think when we talk about an illness, this is what it is. It's like in the moments where you don't expect it, it shows up, right? And no one is, no one is free of it. No one can escape it. And we might want to think that we're experts in it, but we're all on a journey. And it's, we're in a constant journey of recovery. Um, from white supremacy. Yeah, thank you. I want to add two two little stories. One is um, one of the one of the real insights that I well, moments for me about the, learning about the impacts of this stuff. I was at um, after right after the week after the election, the November a year ago, the November election when Trump became president. I was at a Beyond Diversity one on one training with Neona Span, who does uh, on race specifically on race, and it was a really deep immersive, powerful experience. And, and, in that, and in this context, she does a lot of work in affinity groups, and so you spend a lot of time with other, as a white person, with other white people, or with, as black folks, as with, with other black folks. And we, one of the things we were asked to do was to bring our story of our family. And so each of us told the stories of our family and, and the legacy of the family. And after we were done, we looked at these stories and these artifacts that we had placed, and certainly there were some positive stories, but there was such a deep pattern of abandonment. Mm -hmm. There was so much, everybody's story had somebody abandoning somebody <laughs> and leaving them behind. Mm -hmm. And this is, this, is, this is something, this is white violence, is this kind of, like, if you don't conform, you're abandoned because you're gay. You're abandoned because you don't meet the norms that you don't support and uphold the system, this system that is so deep. You will be left behind. You will be abandoned. And, and, and it, I think that one of the things that was very powerful was because we saw this together and our own stories were the kind of literature that we were pulling this from, we were able to grieve together. And, and name it and really be with, what does that mean? What does that do to us? The other story I want to say is I was talking to my coworker, Denise Altivator, who is Passamaquoddy, uh, Wabanaki, and was really instrumental in the, um, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission between the um, state of Maine and the Wabanaki tribe to heal for the child welfare system. A lot of people don't know about this. It's kind of unprecedented. It's the first uh, Truth and Reconciliation Commission between a, a sovereign tribal nation and a U.S. state. And, and, and she, is, she is an incredible person, an incredible um, healer. And she does, she's been doing these decolonial workshops for faith communities, for faith communities to look at themselves and think about themselves and take ownership for the damage that their faith communities has done. Um, in Quakers, that has a lot to do with our support for Indian boarding schools. I mean, there's lots of stories about and colonial colonizing uh, Pennsylvania. There's a lot of stories around that. 
And there was one person in this workshop, a man, a white man, she said a big white man, and in all of the sessions, he was stone-faced. Like, she wasn't getting through. She's like, what am I doing? What's wrong? And then she told the story about her own healing process. And she talks about how, you know, people talk about how forgiveness is required. You know, she's like, I don't have to, I don't have to forgive you for what you did to me in order to heal myself. I can heal without having to, to forgive what you did. I can say that was really wrong and I'm not ready to do that and I can go on and heal. And she talked about how that healing process has happened for her and how the wounds that she had from colonialism and from being totally abused, she was totally abused in the, um, in the adopted family that when she was taken from the tribe that took her in the white family. Um, and she said, and I pass that wound on to my kids, but I'm, I, I'm not passing it on to my grandkids. And I've healed enough so that I'm not doing that. Um, and she told these stories, and then she talked about her own daughter, who, who is, um, is homeless and has been, um, has been on the streets and in, in, in um, the West Coast. And she described her, and she said, this is the wages of colonialism all of these things, and she showed a picture of her daughter. And this man, he stood up, and he started to weep, and he just was sobbing. This man who had been stone-faced this whole time, and he said, what you've told me has changed my whole life. Mm -hmm. I can't be the same person after I leave this room. And, and part of the point that she, of her telling this is that, is that unless you get that deep, we're not going to crack this open. That that this is inside our hearts. It's calcified our hearts. It's made us stone-faced. It's made us stone-hearted. And you have to open that in order to, to begin to heal. And that can be messy and hard and painful. It's painful. That's the first thing you're going to feel, is pain for all that you've suppressed over time. Anybody want to add anything? Sure. Sure. Okay. Right. So the world is in crisis, um, obviously. So extreme weather events are common. Extreme political events are daily. <laughs> um, the wages of white supremacy um, are, as we've been talking about, unmasked. Um, and, and in some ways, Trump you know, serves as a shadow and a revealer, and a great revealer. <laughs> Um, even as so many people, especially people of color, as we've talked about before, have seen this stuff for 400 years, 500 years of colonialism. And I want to talk a little bit, I want to talk about a little bit about how we do social justice work. That, that there's the what of what we do, but then there's also the how. And I want to talk a little bit about like what role does God and the spirit and the divine or whatever love or heart, whatever name you have for this, this thing, that helped to crack open this guy's heart, right? Um, what what is what is made possible now, and how do we how, how do we work in a way that every step we take is building the alternative that we want to see? And and what does that look like? And 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 how what does it taste like? And what does it feel like? I think it's been really interesting because um, I think for people of color, we've been tasting and feeling and knowing this stuff for a long time. But I think uh, the day after the election last year, so many white people suddenly started to be able to feel what we've been talking about for so long. And so um, so for me, in many ways, I talk about Trump as a gift. And I think it's a difficult gift to have, right? I mean, there's a, there's a Chinese curse that says, may you live in interesting times. And these are, pretty much seriously interesting times, right? But I think that we finally got someone who made it possible for us to actually name the thing that we've never been able to name before. Because what he did was run on race. He ran on dog whistles. And he proved to us that Americans can be moved by dog whistles. Even now, this past Tuesday, the majority of white women still voted for conservative candidates who stand against their interests because race 
is still the thing that trumps gender. And we keep acting like we can build these intersectional movements without addressing the racism that's built into those movements and into our systems. But the reality is if we don't center that from whatever place you're coming from, if you're a Christian and you're not able to move away from the evangelical framework that says we can put someone in power who has raped girls, someone who's willing to say I'm going to grab your pussy, you know, senators that have been known to molest girls and banned from malls, then we have to start questioning our moral values, right? And if you're not a Christian, if you're Muslim, if you're, if you're a Jewish person, um, if you're a Buddhist like me, the reality is still from our perspective, we have to be able to look at what God calls us to do, right? And for me, this work is not about a job where I'm gonna get affirmed because of my ego. This is really heart-wrenching work. It's work that takes so much out of you that um, when you fail to rejuvenate, there's a serious physical price. So if I wasn't being called to do it, I don't know that I would do it because it's a lot easier to live a life where you have certainty, this is what I do from day to day. Our lives are not rooted in certainty, they're rooted in the uncertainty of what white supremacy manifests from day to day. So is it a shooting? Is it the lone white, the lone wolf shooting? who we really know is code for the white male domestic terrorist, right? But we can't look, we don't want to look at the pain. But we can't actually make a movement if we don't look at the pain and we don't look at the values or the faith that's moving us. Some of us may not be people of faith, but do you believe in science? Science says we're all energy and energy doesn't die. So how, so what are we building that is actually creating space for us to rejuvenate and to be those sort of energetic beings in a powerful way. Yeah, my partner, Jordana Peacock, does a lot of anti-racist and social justice work from the perspective of justice work is healing work. And it's healing from trauma work, the trauma that we have in our bodies as individuals, the traumas we have in our relationships within our families, within our communities, within our friendship circles, the trauma we have in, in the institutions, in the, in the way that society is organized and governed, the trauma that is the direct result of supremacy systems that dehumanize and devalue and divide us. Mm -hmm. And so that trauma work and healing work needs to be central in how we understand the work of justice. And so being able to think about, yes, we are working to change policy, we are working like in Philadelphia to elect progressive people to district attorney and other positions of power. And so being able to try to get people in office and pass legislation and pass policy and change institutions and in the process of doing work around campaigns, we're also working to help transform our individual lives and our families and our communities and heal and to be able to start to live and breathe and nourish liberation values and liberation culture. And so I encourage everyone to think about the ways that you have superpowers, spiritual superpowers, superpowers of nourishment, of rejuvenation, superpowers of joy, of celebration, of play, of making people laugh and smile and feel connected, superpowers of raising beautiful babies all the superpowers we have that bring life and joy and resilience into our communities and our culture, to use our superpowers in this time because it's both what we are opposed and also what we are for. And so a friend of mine, he talks about, we have one foot in the world as it is, but we always need to remember that we're trying to put our other foot in the world as we want it to be. And so we are both of the world as it is but we are also actively imagining and building and dreaming and breathing life into the world that we want. Even if it's in a moment of beloved community where we feel the shedding of some of this institutional supremacist <clears throat> culture and we feel this sense of connection to each other's humanity and we see each other, we glance at each other, we see each other in a moment of protest and defiance that also connects us to 
we are all trying to get free and we are trying to all help each other be alive in these times and also birth the world that we want to see and so being able to be a part of that process and know that we are healers we are we are artists we are creators we are parents we are people who are helping to generate and live and breathe into the world that we want to have and so doing that along and that also expands how we think about activism activism isn't just going to a protest activism isn't just being a part of a campaign those are important but activism and liberation culture is how we live how we breathe how we how we show up in each other's lives and also how we resist and bring down this horrible supremacist structure can I add to that? Um, I think it was interesting because you talked, um, one of the things I think that white supremacist culture is not is that we all see each other. And there's a South African reading that is Sawabona, uh, and it means I see you. And the response is Sikona, which means because you see me, I am here. Which sort of connects, right? It's like that inextricable web of, of mutuality that Dr. King talks about but that we are coached, we've been coached in this culture where we don't make eye contact, right? We don't see each other. We, in fact, we try to avoid as much as possible. We can, we can look to the side, that's what we're gonna do. And I think really what we're being called to do is to really understand that how we move forward together affects each of us, right? What we do actually, there are ripples, right? And it's connected. And if we're willing to do the work, what we're starting to be willing to do is actually make eye contact and say, huh, okay, you're by my side. We're gonna walk together. We're gonna work together, right? But I have to actually be able to give consent to being see to seeing and to being seen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a couple things that come up for me. One is um, my friend, Neona Span, who I spoke about already, um, she, talked, uh, she talks about how what white supremacy does is it keeps us from seeing what is right in front of us, being able to see and name what is right in front of us. And so just, I mean, part of the practice that she teaches is just be present, be here, and, and start to teach yourself to notice. Like really notice, come back into your body and really notice what is going on. What is the dynamics on the train? You know, many people of color have to watch this stuff. But, but as white people, like, let's, let's root in our bodies and really, really look at stuff. The other thing that's coming up for me is um, there's a Burundian Quaker, David Nianzima, who has done this trauma healing work in Burundi and, and trauma healing work with people who, you know, almost killed each other or, or killed family members, where they can come together and, and, and heal their trauma enough so that they can be in community. And part of that is that they understand that this was all this genocide was governmental, but that, that it wasn't about their neighbors. It was about this government system that was putting, pitting them against each other. And he talks about how um, relationship is his religion. And that, I think, is a really, that's one of the pieces that's really, really important as we move forward to really, to notice, to pay attention, and to be in relationship with one another and understand that we learn how to be in society by how we treat the people that we're with every day. And that we can't, we can't envision this big system change without feeling it in our bodies, in our day-to-day -day lives. And how we treat the person that we meet on the train, how we treat the person who serves us coffee, how we treat the people that we sit next to in cubicles, wherever we are, that that matters and that how we do that is, 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 is really practicing presence and practicing the world we want to live. I th I, I'm an advocate for like figuring out ways to scale up all the time, but I also think that, that, that those moments, moment by moment, we need to, to learn how, a different way to live. Um, yeah. Um, Rumi says, the wound is the place where the light enters you, mm -hmm. right? And, um, and if we look at this moment as a gaping wound that has been that has been there festering, but we've never paid attention, finally we pull the curtain aside, right? And we see it. And that is the, the opportunity is being created within that space because 
change only happens when there's discomfort, mm -hmm. right? Change doesn't happen when we feel good. Mm -hmm. change, change doesn't happen when we're like leading our lives, la, 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 la. <laughs> it's really when the world shows up and it steps on your foot and you're screaming and you're going, oh crap, that hurts, what am I gonna do? Mm -hmm. And that's the moment we're in. We're in this moment where everything that we took for granted that, you know, freedom of the press, could suddenly be gone, we know that. That the government would be, at least you could, pre for white people, you could pretend it was fair, <laughs> right? And now we know it isn't, right? Um, all of these things that we, we could take for granted are now gone. I mean, this whole supposed life, the per life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, right? And yet we have people being able to buy guns, 17 guns, 30 guns at a time, and shoot up people watching concerts. But they're taking away those people's rights to life, liberty, and happiness, but nobody cares because there's another amendment, the Second Amendment, right? And so all of these things, but we have space now to actually really wrestle with this stuff, which we didn't have before. So I wanna like have um, a more of a conversation about healing and, like, and what you both have seen as um, as 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 real models for the deepest kind, the deepest kind of healing the healing that we're really called to and need right now, um, and and I I, I want to hear stories and and what you've seen that's powerful in your faith communities, um, and and what and and we've already started talking about the body but really what the role of the body is in that. Yeah. <clears throat> want to start, Chris? <laughs> <laughs> Jinx. <laughs> yeah, I mean I think for. <clears throat> I think the healing work is trying to figure out more and more ways that we can create community healing and ways of creating ritual and creating, creating opportunities in which there's community healing because a lot of what I know of and have experienced has been more amongst smaller groups, amongst people one-on-one, -on -one, which is also really important, but also being able to figure out how we can create, I mean, a lot of ways, protests, Protest is an opportunity for public rituals of grief and public rituals of outrage. But if we were to actually use some of these public expressions of our outrage as also public spaces of healing, of, of resilience, of nourishment. So in, in the Unitarian Universalist denomination that I'm a part of, um, there's been a lot in this past since the, so with Black Lives Matter movement, a real radicalizing of a lot of forces within the Unitarian Universalists, in particular, long time people of color, <laughs> racial justice leaders, as well as newer people of color, racial justice leaders, uh, activated by the Black Lives Matter movement, as, as, well, as well as newer and older white anti-racist folks, really mobilized, radicalized by the Black Lives Matter movement. After the election, a lot of energy then going into, okay, there is no more time to waste in seeing the ways that our own institutions, our own faith, our own congregations reproduce white supremacy. And so an incident around racist hiring really sparked a denominational wide outpouring of stories from people of color about the ways that racism plays out in the faith, in hiring, in leadership, in membership, in worship, in all kinds of different ways that white supremacy manifests both in terms of the life of the faith and how people interact and treat each other, but also the ways then that white supremacy is normalized and racial justice is marginalized. And so that kind of speaking out and speaking truth and then also having white anti-racists amplify and stand behind the, the demands around increased hiring of people of color, increased commitment around um, people of color's leadership within the faith, within worship, within congregations. Um, and so I wouldn't say that there has been um, necessarily a denominational white healing, but one of the things that did happen around, uh, right before the, this denominational white outpouring of stories and outrage about racist practice, racist culture, a commitment was made in the mostly white Unitarian Universal Estate by the Board of Trustees of the denomination to raise uh, uh, over $5 million to support 
the Black Lives and Unitarian Universalism, a, a, a radical black liberation, Unitarian Universalist organization that has been really revitalizing and reviving the liberation values and cultures of Unitarian Universalist faith and expanding and bringing it into the streets as well as into congregations. And so a commitment around congregations raising money to support the work of Black Lives of UU and transforming it from this idea that it's a charity of let's give to these you know black folks and try to like say okay are we all cool now and like almost kind of like you know okay we're gonna like write a check and be like okay can we like racism's done like we're post racial now we write a check um, into how can how can this money be a way for we as a faith to say the this organizing this black liberation leadership is at the center of who we want to be in the world. These are the values that actually bring our faith alive. This is leadership that is bringing our faith into relevancy and a radical urgent crying out and organizing in this moment. How is this an expression of how we want to live and be as a faith community? And so this is about supporting leadership. This isn't about charity. Does that make sense? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And so it's deep, because a, a, a Unitarian Universalist congregation even shared with me a story about how they had done this work realizing that they had a lot of money in their endowment that was rooted in the sailing industry, the boat industry, connected to the transatlantic slave trade. And so out of that knowledge of that history and doing anti-racist work, they decided they wanted to make a, a significant contribution to Black Lives and Unitarian Universalism. As, as an organizing force within the faith. And so they were feeling really good about how they were gonna make this big donation. As they were making the donation, some of the people on the decision-making body started saying, well, these were white people, saying, well, you know, I have a lot of experience uh, in business. Maybe I could help them think about how best to use their money. <laughs> or I'm an accountant. Maybe I could help them figure out how to make a good budget to maximize the donation we're getting. And then suddenly someone said, okay, look, we're talking about making this donation, but we're doing it in a way that's reproducing white supremacy in the very act of our very well-intentioned giving of support in a way that is almost saying, like, yes, here is some money, but you all need our help, you all need our leadership, we don't trust you, we don't believe in you, you aren't able to lead yourselves, you aren't able to lead us. And so reproducing white supremacy in the very act of well-intentioned white anti-racism and so the deepness of this stuff and we have to heal that even as we're trying to do the anti-racist work itself so that was a story of them then realizing that and being like oh my gosh this is we're, we want to break out of that cycle we need to give this donation not from a place of charity but again you all are leading us forward and we want to follow the vision that you all are leading and we want to support that leadership um it's interesting because I think white people always walk in the room and ask us, what can I do to help? <laughs> right? What can I do? I'm really frustrated. What can I do? Um, I'm really anxious. What can I do? Right? And we always redirect people to um, parts of our, we always do a, a, a part of our meeting. Every time we meet, um, there's a vulnerable vulnerability exercise that we do. And sometimes it's, we do an eye gazing exercise. And the reason we do it is because when people stare at each other for seven minutes, you're supposed to fall in love with each other. So we only do it for three. <laughs> um, but, but, when, but that three minutes is enough for people to suddenly have a sense of who the other person is, not from a word space or what they say, but from a spirit place and from being able to look in their eyes and actually, because the eyes really are the gateway to the soul, like see a little bit of their soul. And I always, people always say afterwards, well, I, I feel like I'm connected to that person. And I'm like, that's what healing looks like. Mm -hmm. Healing looks like, like us being, me being able to look at you and see your value, see your divinity, see the blessing that you were when you came forth from your mother's womb, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so we haven't been able to do that because our communities are taught to not create ritual, to not be together, to not recognize each other's space within this cosmic um, moment that we are in. And so for me, healing is the pra is sort of um, uh, the foundation so that we can actually do the work of organizing. Because if we can heal ourselves 
and heal each other, then our organizing is so much better. We actually, um, Power Northeast is part of the PICO National Network, and that stands for People Improving Communities um, Through Organizing, and we're actually about to change our name, but just, I'm gonna stick with that for now. Um, but, but one of the things that we've done is that we've sort of looked at, because um, really white supremacy couldn't have gone as far without white Christian supremacy. Mm -hmm. It's the marriage of the two that has really mm -hmm. made it such an incredible force that we, we're, we're, um, we're being yanked by and we don't even realize. And so we, they've actually come out with a theology of resistance. Um, mm -hmm. And that idea is that there's an encounter mm -hmm. section where we look at the problem, um, not just externally, but internally. And then we look at how it makes us feel, then we go to a place where we can disrupt that happening within us. So in that moment that I was walking in Lincoln Center, where I was feeling all those stomach knots, that was my encounter. But then, because I was gut checking myself, I could disrupt my narrative that I'd created around that. And then there is um, a space that you move to where you can reimagine what what you're doing and what the problem is from a different space because you're looking at it differently. And then from there you can take prophetic action, right? Because you've sort of gone through this cycle where you've looked, you've forced yourself and the, pro and the project and the campaign to sort of go through these parameters and then you can get to a place where you can be really curious and you can really create from a different lens than what we've been creating all along. Because I always say, if we had it right, in organizing, we would be winning more, <laughs> right? And we don't have. And what you have to say for people on the right is that they've gotten a na their narrative right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Their narrative moves people, mm -hmm. and we haven't gotten to a place where we mm -hmm. have moved mm -hmm. away from an intellectual understanding of what is going on in our world to a heart mm -hmm. understanding of what's going on in our world. Because the place you can't fix the problem from where it started. Mm -hmm. It started in our heads. So we have to move out of that space so we can get to our hearts, so we can figure out new solutions to what we've been fighting against. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So what you said, something that you said earlier reminded me of um, my friend Victoria Green who runs Every Murder is Real, which is uh, a New York healing center. Um, her son was a victim of murder and she does trauma healing support for um, the families of murder victims. And she said, she became a Quaker a few years ago and she came to meeting, she, she actually did a program at Green Street Meeting and then she came to meeting for worship. And, and one thing that really hooked her was the idea of that of God in everyone. And she said, if we, if we, if you really believe that, if you walk down the street, and every person you encounter, that man that you were encountering the subway, if you really see that of God in, the, in every single person, that is a revolutionary idea. Mm -hmm. and, that, and that is the undoing of white supremacy. If we really understand that this person is a child of God, is precious from the moment they're born, and if we really mean it about everybody, <laughs> You know, that is, that is a transformative vision of the world. And, and, and I, I mean, I think about that and I'm moved by that. And, like, it, and if we have a practice of walking through the world that way, you know, that changes things. That changes the energy in spaces. Um, I love the story both of you told, and I love that, that, that story about, about winning and winning the narrative, particularly. And I also think that there's this other piece, which is that um, when we start to do this, when we start to be embodied, when we start to see what we've, we've been taught not to see, that shit hits the fan. <laughs> that the stuff inside us comes up, the poison has to be released, and, and it gets messy. And I think about in Quaker, in Quaker communities in Philadelphia Yearly Meeting, for example, where there is huge backlash. There is like, we do not want to face this. Let's push this thing back into the closet. Let us, we cannot look at this. And it's, it's, it's violent and it's very, very charged. And like, how do we deal with that? I mean, like obviously in the larger political realm, we're looking at huge backlash. 
backlash. Like there's change, there's change, there's emerging change. And then there's like, whoa, no, we're not gonna do that. Let's close this door. And I wanna, I wonder what your thoughts are about dealing with the messiness and the, and the like, way that, that all the poison comes out. Um, I don't wanna, I, I could start if you want me to. Um, I think one of the things we have to look at is that um, what's the biggest fear that white people have about doing this work? And someone named it at one of our trainings the other day. They were like, I'm afraid I'm going to do it wrong and people are going to think I'm racist. So let me just like put you at ease. You are. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Right All right. Right? It's okay. The world didn't end. The world's not over. There's no way for a white person to exist in this reality without being racist. It's not a choice. So nobody expects you to have chosen this, right? So if we say, you're all racist, the world isn't going to end, let's look at it, right? Because I think the reason people don't want to see it, because the definition of racism to people is these horrible, horrific people who are violent and complicit. Well, you don't have to be any of that because the system is ingenious. You can be completely silent and be completely like, I'm a good person and I'm not going to do any of those things and still participate in the system. Because it's built like that. It's operating the way it's intended to. When we see a policeman gets off, there's nothing unusual. It's operating as it was intended to. Right? And so if we can take that away, I mean, I think a big part of the healing is being able to take that piece off the table and say, okay, yes, okay, I am that. All right, now how do we do this work? Right? Because then it says, I'm not looking at you and judging you. You know, I'm not looking at you and blaming you. We're not going to get anywhere if we're blaming and shaming people, but we also have to look at the truth, right? We need to look at how these systems were built. We need to look at how we per perpetuate them, and intentionally or unintentionally. And we need to be able to like say, I'm going to do the work. It's going to suck. It's not going to be fun. Sometimes I'm gonna be really racist and someone's gonna call me out on my shit. Okay. You know, it, and, and that's it, like that it's not that big a deal. Like it really is saying, I consent to doing the work. If we can say yes to this work, I think we start to transform not just our communities, but the country, right? And, and I think that's been the big obstacle because every single movement we haven't been able to actually move beyond where we needed to go because we don't, we can't build across difference because we haven't been able to have these conversations because white people have no calluses for race and people of color have all the fucking calluses, <laughs> right? And we need to balance it out, right? And, and also, I mean, <laughs> Also, a lot of times, like, you know, earnest white people want to do the work, and you want black people to help you do the work. Yeah. And I'm going to tell you, in my 20s, I was like, fuck you, do your own work. And I'm 50, and I understand that I have some responsibility, but I don't have it all. Right? And so instead of asking people of color to do the work, ask them to point you in directions, or better yet, Google. <laughs> There's a whole heck of a lot of anti-racist stuff in the world, and that, it's like, we can't validate your good white person-ness, right? And I think oftentimes that's what people want. And being able to not operate on this treadmill that you don't realize you're on. So I, mean, I think with the, with the trying to organize in, in white communities and in, in, in the messiness or, or organizing in majority white faith communities or congregations or whatever it is, I think for myself, you know, I think there's, there's, there's different work. So as, as you said, there's different work that different folks are engaged in. So I don't expect people of color to be deeply involved in the emotional journey of white people's work around anti-racism. I mean, I'm not saying that there's, you know, folks, there's, you know, some folks of color are involved in that work, some folks of color bring leadership to that work. But for white anti-racists to be able to go through an emotional healing journey to be able to then show up in ways, because sometimes, you know, when I first became, started becoming conscious of this, it was like, you know, I hated white people. 
You know, I was like learning all this like horrible stuff. I hated myself as a white person. I hated other white people. And then I thought my job was just to go around and yell at other white people about how racist they were. And you know, I mean, that was effective. You know, that made that five percent effective and ninety-five percent totally ineffective. But it was how do I actually start transforming this consciousness from just an emotional reaction of guilt and shame and, and, and horror into one of outrage about what structural white supremacy does to people, does to children, turning white children into accomplices or or or, or building the base of support for a murderous institutional policy against communities of color. What does white supremacy do to white people? And so that as white anti-racists are being outraged about the structure and culture of white supremacy and actually developing a profound revolutionary love for people who look like you to want to help support them to get free and help support them to be involved and connected to the work. Because white supremacy is, has an open hand inviting white people to participate in it every day. Every day, white people, when they wake up and walk out into the world, are invited, once again, participate in white supremacy today. Here's all the ways you can. You can have a whole menu of options, conscious white supremacy, unconscious white supremacy, feel good white supremacy that still makes you feel well intentioned, all kinds of different options. White anti-racist, instead of saying like, oh, all these white people, I'm so much better than all those white people, screw all those white people, and they don't even understand what they're doing, and they're not down. White anti-racists need to start creating daily invitational opportunities for more and more white people to be on the right side of history. And that means where people are at. Not saying where people are at and you stay where they're at, but meeting people where they're at to help bring them in. So for example, in a congregation of mostly white folks who are like flipping out and saying, we don't wanna talk about racism anymore. First thing, you don't need everyone to understand that it's a priority. No social justice movement in history has ever had the majority of society actively supporting it at the time that it passed legislation and, and had victories that helped transform the society. So where you're not trying to convince everyone, we're trying to create a critical mass that transforms the way that the culture and society operates, that then transforms culture, behavior, and how communities live. So we're not trying to win over everyone. So don't waste your time on the Facebook troll that is always <laughs> arguing with you. Start thinking about how you're trying to change the hearts and minds of people on the sidelines, people who are confused, people who are unsure, people who might be involved but don't even know how to start. And so inviting people into the process of racial justice, and so for white anti-racists to move away from a pushing away other white people into a, I wanna actively create opportunity, I wanna become an architect of infrastructure that brings more and more white people into the work, either as greeters at racial justice fundraisers at the congregation, either as people who are inviting one or two people in their networks to come to an event, either as, hey, can you help lead a song in our congregation where we're gonna be speaking about racial justice that day, doing all kinds of different ways to create 30 different levels of involvement where you can invite people to participate low level, medium level, high level, and increase their participation over time. Because we want millions of people, millions of white people, to see racial justice as key to the future of this society and key to their own humanity. And again, we're not asking people to show up perfect. The right wing, they look and they see people and they say, yes, we are broken. Yes, we are, we are a mess. Yes, we are, you know, they talk about sinners, all kinds of stuff. You all are imperfect people that need to be saved by this movement. The left who often says, show up perfect and then you can join. As opposed to, yes, we are messy. Yes, we are imperfect. Yes, we're trying to make sense of this. Yes, we're trying to get free. Yes, we're harming each other in the process of trying to figure this stuff out. And not saying that harm then is unaccountable and not, not challenged or changed, but to say that, yes, we are on a journey together. Be a part of it. We want you to be a part of it. You don't have to show up and have all of it totally figured out before you can be involved. We're not creating clubs, we're creating movements to change society. I don't think I have anything to add to that. Um, <laughs> so the next thing, I, like, I think that's really great and, the, and the, the piece about white supremacy creating all these opportunities for, for white people to participate in it. I mean, I think one of the ways that it does that is it mirrors back to white people that they matter if they do. And so I've been thinking a lot about, about the ways that a life is telling you that you matter. 
and a way that a life tells you you don't matter. And there's, there's, there's you know, with the Black Lives Matter movement, there's the obvious, like, getting shot by the police is a way to say, you know, you don't matter. But I, I think about the day-to-day -day interaction of people and the day-to-day -day, um, experience of people. And I, I, I just, I want to throw that out there and ask, like, what does it mean, like, what you're talking about, like what would it mean to construct, you know, systems or or interventions that 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 tell black folks and people of color they matter in a day-to-day -day way and and tell white people they matter if they if they participate in ending white supremacy. Mm. Um, it's interesting. Um, how many times are we in spaces where it's all white? How many people have been in rooms where it's all white? Can I see a show of hands? Um, so how you tell people their matter is when you notice who's not in the room. Right? Who's in because the, the reality is that, you know, usually we walk in, we don't notice that there's a whole bunch of people missing from the conversation. And often the conversation may even be about those people, but there's no representation, right? And so I think it's a uh, probably the simplest thing, I mean, honestly, the truth is that these times really are calling for us to be pretty courageous. You know, if we, if we really look at what's going on, we're, we're on a pathway to fascism, right? I think a lot of us don't wanna hear that, but if we look historically, if we look at what happened in Germany, we can see all of the same sort of markers happening here. And, um, and so the little things matter. Right? Interrupting matters in the moment. When somebody says something, when something happens, say something, right? When you feel, so many times, friends will tell me later, this happened and I knew it was super racist and I, and I didn't know what to say. Well, you're not, never gonna have the perfect answer. But saying something counts more than saying nothing, right? And, uh, and I think that's, it's sort of like developing a muscle. I think that, you know, it's like it's a muscle that you don't have. But in order to build it, you have to keep using it. So you're not gonna do it perfectly. <coughs> but if you decide in your mind that you're gonna be conscious when you're in a room and there's no one else represented, or you're gonna be conscious when somebody says something that is really <coughs> wrong, but because you're white, they thought it was okay to say it around you. Um, you're building, you're starting to build the, the muscle to actually do, to be an anti-racist, right? And, um, and I think that's part of what our movement building looks like too, because, you know, honestly, the truth is that, you know, people of color don't trust white people. For good reason, right? Yeah. <laughs> right? Um, and so, for us to build a movement, Movements need relationship and it needs trust. So in order to build trust, the people on the receiving end have to actually believe that you're really allies, and, and I don't even like the word ally. I like the word co-conspirator because allies don't have skin in the game. Um, but for us to begin to trust you, you have to trust yourself, right? And so if you're, if you're doing the work and you're able to name your stuff, and you're able to actually start interrupting and building those muscles, there's a tell to that. There, there's something that tells us that, right? And so this is, what, this is what I'm saying, it's so important not to wait for a thing. Like a rally is great to go to, and we feel great when, when you're in community like that because it's a buildup of energy, and that energy um, has a ripple effect on us all. But the real work is when you're sitting in your office and somebody says some bullshit, or you're at your dinner table at Thanksgiving and Uncle Bob says something racist, and I'm not telling you to attack them. I'm saying listen from a place of, a deep place of listening. This whole system of appreciative inquiry. What did you mean, Uncle Bob? Uncle Bob, you said this. Did you mean this by that, right? And because if you start questioning people, you make them have to question themselves. And they're just spitting stuff out that they've been programmed to spit out. So if you're creating the space for them to hear themselves, you might actually have an opportunity to engage. And it may not, you're not, you're not gonna necessarily get closure and 
change 70 years of Uncle Bob's racist thoughts, but you're gonna create the opportunity for some curiosity. And at least then it doesn't come, they don't say it and it just kind of lands and nobody touches it and somebody else gets poisoned by its toxicity. Yeah, yeah so I grew up in a family where his name wasn't Uncle Bob, it was a different uncle, <laughs> who, who, who said a lot of the time similar things. And so the young kid, you know, six years old, eight years old, you know, most of the, many of the white men who would speak in my, you know, from our extended family, mostly white working class, would all come together. And, you know, there's often this thing, you know, white people don't like to talk about race. You, know, you hear that a lot, right? Particularly in like progressive white circles, you know, white people don't like to talk about race. Well, there's a lot of white people that do like to talk about race, but they're often racist. And so the racists talk about race, and then the good progressive white people feel super awkward and don't know what to say about race, or think that they're so well-intentioned that they don't even have to worry about race because they're beyond race. And so the, 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 the awkward white people who want racial justice but aren't really sure what to do are often too often quiet, and then the races just go on and on and on. But thankfully, my mom, when I was six, when I was eight, when I was 10, I would hear her argue with them and say, no, you're wrong. Even sometimes that's all she would say is, no, you're wrong. And then they would, because misogyny was at that point too, they would cut her off. But me hearing my mom say, no, you are wrong, opened up the space for me to think about a whole other world existing. So every day, I'm so grateful for my mom and her no that led me to seek out yeses. And so even being able to, and also with Uncle Bob, oftentimes you're not trying to convince Uncle Bob to change his mind. I try to think about my, my grandfather, who was you know, uh, a right-wing, grassroots, uh, anti-majority humanity agenda person. And for a minute there, I was like, I'm gonna change him into a feminist, anti-racist socialist. <laughs> and then I realized, I realized that what I'm, what I'm actually trying to do is not change my, my grandfather, I'm trying to engage my cousins, my aunts, my uncles, the friends, neighbors across the street who are eating dinner with us. I'm trying to engage all those folks who aren't even participating. And then I started realizing that actually what I really need to be doing is helping to divert the conversation away from the one dominated by the racist and actually help create space for my mom and women in the family to take over the conversation entirely. And so it was like a engage to say no and, 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 and show opposition because people are listening. I mean, eight to 16 year old kids all around this table listening to grown white folks go out on and on and on with a racist worldview. And if no one says no, even if there's like five people in the room who are white who are totally uncomfortable with what's going on, all those kids think this is just normal. And so being able to, to register resistance, and so for me, within the family, within society, it's how do we marginalize the right, win the center, and build the left. And so how do we do that within our families, how do we do that within our communities, you know, try to win over as much of the right as possible as we can as well. But to not give Uncle Bob more and more of a platform and try to actually get other voices and more progressive into the conversation in our dinner, in our dinner tables, in our communities, and on and on. I have, um, I want to invite you all to into the conversation, but I'm gonna ask one more question, which is just the trickiness of living an embodied white, as a white anti-racist, like, um, like talking about that, and then what does real accountability look like? And, and um, either one of you can start. I don't think I can do the white anti-racist. <laughs> yeah, you, <that's> right. <laughs> you want to start that, Chris? <clears throat> yeah. Then we'll give Jude the final word in this part. Yeah, so it's like totally awkward, right? For those of you who are white, for those of you who are men who are committed to feminism, for those of you who are exist in some <coughs> level of institutional privilege, when you start to come into consciousness about that privilege, and you're like, oh my gosh, I do not want to be a part of that, and I want to, you know, uh, align myself with people who are experiencing oppression within this, and then all, next thing you know, you're like, 
Am I interacting with that person because I want them to justify my existence and tell me I'm a good person? Do I want to actually build a meaningful relationship with them? Next thing you know, you like overthought the situation and that person has left the room. And so <laughs> over and over again, you know, you're like sort of like I'm either microaggressioning or I'm disappearing into the walls, or you know, you're just sort of like this like fumbling person who's like, oh okay. Because again, the role models, the culture, all of it is set up to support white people to consciously or unconsciously reproduce white supremacy. So if a white person is all of a sudden, on this day, I want to begin to be on a path of liberation, I want to be on the path of racial justice, it's like, I don't even know where to put my foot because every time I look to see where I might step, it's on the back of a person of color, it's on the face of a person of color, it's reproducing a mistake I studied in a history book somewhere, I don't even know what to do. And so for myself, as a person who found out I was racist and I found out I was sexist, I was like, the best thing I can do is, is to stay in bed and not interact with people. <laughs> you know? Like that, I'm gonna call, her, I'm gonna write on Facebook, staying home again today is my job and my part in the revolution. <laughs> Let me know when I can come out and not reproduce oppression today, you know? Keep it posted. Yeah, that, that's not helpful, because we're in a process, we're in a journey, and we are, we are literally posed to inflict pain on each other because of the way that structural supremacy has been set up. And so to be able to begin to trust ourselves, which is hard because all of a sudden you start to realize, oh my gosh, I got all this like internalized stuff. I don't even know if I'm like well-intentioned. I don't know about my impacts. I don't understand. And so I don't trust myself. And so you're on a journey of finding leaders, mentors, a, a role models, people who you can learn from, be in relationship to. You are on a journey to transform your life. And so having mentors for me was absolutely essential. Older generation, more experienced, peer level mentors, younger folks who have been at the work and were seriously fed up with people who are older than them not being able to get this right and get it figured out. So finding inspiration, role models, mentors, support, reading, studying, studying because our life depends on it. Figuring this stuff out, finding people like Anne and Carl Ray, the white anti-racist Southerners in the 50s and 60s who were working against white supremacy and trying to win the hearts and minds of the white South to join the black freedom movement that was transforming the country. Finding these lost histories, finding these, last, these lost role models and being able to bring them in. Looking to people of color, not as you know, a friend of mine, you know, segregation led to the fact that when I was 18, I had one, you know, there was only one black person I'd ever had a meaningful friendship with. And he said at one point, he was like, stop talking to me as if all these leaders of color are like just my leaders. They're your leaders too. You need to understand that these are your leaders. They're not just mine. And so being able to start to read Audre Lorde, Bell Hooks, all these incredible women of color feminists, Gloria Anzaldúa in her, her book Borderland has an incredible chapter towards the end in which she specifically discusses ways that white people can show up in racial justice work. The writing is there, but white people have been trained, I have been trained to not hear those voices. So a person of color can spend 30 minutes talking about all the ways white people can show up in effective multiracial organizing, and at the end I'll still be like, okay, so what do I do? Because I, because I have been trained to not be able to hear the leadership of people of color. I have been trained to not be able to hear the leadership of feminine sounding voices. I have been trained, and so I have to actively be like encouraging and building up that muscle to listen deeply as if my life actually depended on the leadership of people of color and women and trans and gender queer feminine, feminine galaxy people to be part of the leadership that I need. And so I need to be able to listen with my head, with my heart, with my soul, and be able to engage. And so once we move from that place of this is my life, this is my children, this is our future, and not just this is my ego needing to get affirmed, which is understandable. I love that there's white people who want their ego affirmed for racial justice, as opposed to white people committed to racism. It's a spectrum. There's the white people who are the plan. There's white people who are committed to a GOP white supremacy. I want super well-intentioned liberal white people who are totally confused about race and don't think they are an issue because at least they're somewhere on the spectrum that then they, we can be in relationship to move those people. We have to move, the, not for people of color to love those well-intentioned white liberal people, but for white anti-racists to not give up on those well-intentioned white liberal people and write them off as I'm so much more advanced than them, but to actively work to win the hearts and minds of every white person we can potentially reach within our spectrum, within our spheres, and move them. And so being able to work through the awkwardness, the awkwardness is part of life. 
The awkwardness is often the moments of the most brilliant transformation. The awkwardness of a first kiss. The awkwardness of telling someone you love them for the first time. The awkwardness of saying, I want to win a just world against white supremacy in public is super awkward. <laughs> but what is normal for most of us who are privileged is to go about the way the system was designed. And so we have to get awkward for justice. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> um, good t-shirt. Uh, so I'm going to start with the hashtag, trust black women, right? Right? Um, you know, when I look back, uh, we look at who, in 2016, who knew who to vote for. 90, what is it, 93% of black women voted for Hillary, right? When we look back at this past Tuesday, again, black women were the reason that that democratic wave happened in Virginia. Yes. If you go back, white women actually voted overwhelmingly for the conservatives yet again, right? Um, and so really, if you, accountability is about trusting people of color. And oftentimes when people of color tell white people, this is how it is about this issue about race, they go, really, are you, sh are you sure it was racism, Aww. right? And we get that all the time, right? Because people, because white people have been programmed to feel superior, that you actually know more about everything, including this experience that you couldn't possibly know anything about, which is what it is to live in brown, black and brown, and non-white skin, right? And so when, I'd like to ask you to check yourselves when you are in spaces where a person of color is making a suggestion or speaking about race, or not even about race, but check your reaction, right? If you automatically start speaking over that person or automatically discount what they're saying, and I'm not saying all people of color are brilliant, I'm simply saying, but if there's an automatic reaction to like, well, no, it's this, check yourself, right? I mean, it's like, a lot of the account accountability has to be self-accountability, but I think it's starting to listen to how you operate in the world. Like, you know, you've decided not to take the blue pill, you're taking the red pill, right? Like start paying attention to what you're saying in the moments you're saying it. And if there's a little thing happening in your gut, it's probably right. It's probably really because you have a different brain in your gut, right? You actually essentially have two brains, one in your head and one in your gut. And so those feelings that operate in your gut, when they sort of, like that warning signal goes off, trust it. Because it's guiding you in the right direction. And our heads are always telling us, we only, only this knows. But really your whole body knows. Mm -hmm. And so I'd like to invite you to like trust your body, because that's actually revolutionary, because white supremacy has told us not to trust the body that the body is evil and dirty and nasty because it's tied to white Christian supremacy. Yeah. And you have to undo that too. So, I mean, there's so much we have to undo as a country, as a people. Race is just one, is like one significant part, but also the whole idea of how we inhabit ourselves, mm. to me, is really a critical part of the conversation mm. and part of holding ourselves accountable. So uh, we're going to open it up to you all. Um, and I'm sure that um, you've been thinking a lot and have a lot of perspective. And um, I want to thank Chris and Jude, but we're going to we'll have more time for thinking in, in a minute. So what are your thoughts? What are your questions? What are your comments? What's rising for you? OK. Hi. Hi. Um, we've got a mic, so wait for the mic. So. I just had a question sort of about the last thing that you just said and connecting it to the initial story that you told about walking down the street and seeing um, somebody, uh, say a black person with a hoodie on. And when you told that first story, it was almost like your head was kind of fighting your, your maybe not your gut, maybe somewhere else, but it was like fighting that, that sort of fear that was somewhere. And then, but sometimes you have you're in your own head and you have to trust your gut because it's telling you something. So I was wondering if you could comment on, on sort of that those two things. Well, I mean, what I was saying is that my gut was saying, oh my God, I'm afraid, oh my God, my, I'm afraid. But in that moment, my head was going, there's nothing to be afraid of. 
And so I sort of negotiated those two things mm -hmm. and said, hmm, there's nothing to be afraid of. This is really just how I've been programmed. And so being able to listen to what was happening here allowed me to have a, an actual process intervention to say, okay, hmm, check in, is it really danger? No, there's no danger. And then being able to move forward as a result of being able to a analyze that in that moment. Anything else? Really? Uh, here's a question. <clears throat> I sort of feel like there's a lot of framework for this, so I'm gonna try to keep it brief, but I was having a conversation with my younger brother the other day, and he said some things to me that I didn't quite know how to respond to, and I would like to pose it to you guys to see what your perspective would be. Um, he lives in Alabama, and we were talking about life in Alabama, and racism, of course, came up. And we were talking about, um, you know, in his mind, there are two different types of racism, the racism in the heart that you feel for another person, and then the institutionalized racism, and the white supremacy that gets sort of bred into our whole culture and the politics of it. And the idea then came up that black people or people of color cannot be racist. An idea that I've heard before and uh, agree with, and my little brother said that, he, or younger brother, said that he did not agree with that because he knows of these small towns in Alabama where the whole government structure is all made up of black people and they are absolutely in a position to oppress white people. So there's no way that can be true. I didn't quite know how to respond to that and I would like your thoughts. It's a long one. Yeah, I mean, there's all these, there's all kinds of like stories right now about how like the like Muslims are like taking over areas of the country and are like you know enforcing uh, you know some sort of like this like you know Islamophobic version of like Islamic law and there's like you know uh, black people who are in positions of power who are you know oppressing white people. I mean you know Attorney General Jeff Sessions said that the Justice Department now, the Civil Rights Division of the Justice Department, is no longer going to be investigating racism in police and policing, but is instead going to be looking at the ways that white people are discriminated against right. by affirmative action. Oh. And that, and that white people are being, so, so your younger brother, your younger brother, so it's, it's one of those things where it's like, the, the, the white supremacy is inviting your younger brother into a worldview that is coming from the federal government, that is coming from uh, you know, uh, Fox News on a regular basis, story after story after story, but it's not even just the right wing media, but it's this idea that people of color are, you know, uh, discriminating and racist against white people. So, I mean, I think, you know, the People's Institute has a really good definition of, of racism, which is racial prejudice plus institutional power. And so your younger brother can say, well, they're in institutional power, they're in city government, but even just being able to say, you know, uh, looking at the overall uh, legislative power in the United States and who has power and the laws and the history, but just really trying to invite your your younger brother into a conversation about like, so why do you really think that? And trying to just the appreciative inquiry that was already mentioned, because in this case it's like a one-on-one -on -one conversation to be able to really try to be, so you know, what, what, do you, what does that look like and what do you mean and what are you talking about? And of course there can be moments when people are, you know, prejudiced against each other, having a prejudgment of someone based on a generalization about who they are, of, you know, oh, I don't, you know, a young black kid saying to a young white kid, you know, I don't like white people. You know, but that's not white supremacy. That's not racism. Institutional power. That's just, you know, someone just saying something in relationship to one's. You know. So being able to try to break that stuff down, because it's so often in this country, the idea of institutional power gets blurred into just like individual choices, individual behavior, individual people. And so that institutional power piece, I think, is really important. But using the appreciative inquiry to try to understand where your younger brother is coming from, and again, that these stories, this worldview, is the, the right wing has presented that worldview to white people. So right now, all over the country and on campuses, these flyers are being put up by the alt right that says it's okay to be white. Mm -hmm. And so what they're trying to do is get the left to say no, it's not okay to be white. They're trying to get the what they're trying to get a reaction from the left that is gonna then mobilize white people to say, see, all these diversity, multicultural, feminist, anti-racist people, they hate white people. And so what we need to be able to do is not buy into the narrative worldview that they're trying to create to 
mobilize white people to the alt right and white men in particular, but to be able to be, you know, I mean, for me, it's like, yeah, I mean, I love white people. I, will, I love white people. I want white people to be on the side of racial justice on ending white supremacy. It's okay to be white working to end white supremacy, working to for equality. So being able to just change the narrative, engage the narrative, but knowing that there's a narrative that is actively working to get your young brother to believe that is helpful to then engage. Um, yeah, and I think that, um, you know, for white people, white people's actions are individual actions, and people of color's actions are collective actions, mm -hmm. right? So for example, so your, so your younger brother seeing a small town with black people in power, it's like, oh wow. So it's sort of like, I equate it to, I went to Oberlin College in Ohio, right? And, um, and I remember a white friend saying, why do all the black kids sit together, mm -hmm. right? Now, of course, the majority of the college was white kids. And when we looked out, the majority, all the white kids were sitting together. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I'm just, if you reframe mm -hmm. where, what people are saying, you start, if, there's another lens, right? And so, um, when you when you think about that, you th you realize that um, any hint of black power says, "Oh my God, they've taken over," mm -hmm. right? But is it real power, right? So one, at a small town level, how much power do you really have on people's lives? Two, if all of those folks in that particular town were to say, "Fuck white people," and we're gonna screw all, we're gonna fire all the white people in the town. And do you really think that could happen? They could try it. But do you think it could last? Do you think that white people couldn't actually go and complain to someone higher up than them? That would reinstitute all, all the stuff that was already there? I mean, I think it's like, you know, somehow blackness is overwhelming. Like a little bit of blackness suddenly says, oh crap. <coughs> It's like, really? So it's, it's like, let's look at the entire system. How much black collective power is there in this country? Or brown collective power? Or Muslim collective power? Or Jewish collective power? Right? And so the reality, it's easy to say, wow, in this instance, this instance right here is different than all these other instances. But what's the dominant instance? You know, it's sort of like, you know, the fear on the alt rights sort of supposed fear that, you know, black, like about black people, I don't understand. All the CEOs are still white, right? Like all the executives are still white. The majority of our government is still white and actually mostly white male, not even white female, mostly still white male. But when one person of color elevates to a position suddenly we feel like there's reverse discrimination. But guess what? There's no such thing as reverse discrimination. People of color can't discriminate against white people because we don't hold the institutional power. I think just real quick, one other thing to just say with, your, with in general with the story with your young brother is to also just talk about the ways that the black freedom movement and work against racism has actually expanded democratic rights for working class and poor white people in this country over and over and over again. And so in, this, in, in much, in much of, of, of the US South, being able to win public education for working class and poor white people came after the end of the Civil War during Reconstruction in which black political power and actual working class white political power also grew and the ability to then have black elected officials actually led to an expansion of educational opportunities for working class and poor white people as well as uh, young black people. And so just being able to talk about actually one of the reasons you fear this is because those who actually have the power want us to believe that black people are going to oppress white people when actually the reverse has been true over and over and over throughout history. The more we have racial justice, the more we have democratic rights for everyone. Um, last week, uh, in my all-white Quaker meeting, I held a worship share discussion on uh, white privilege, and I had written some stuff on the preliminary before that, which was kind of introducing white supremacy stuff. Um, and the conversation kind of the silence by one of the people was about, um, well, 
I can't believe that they're about race because late classes and they should be talking about. Mm -hmm. And it was Richard Turner, so it wasn't a place to give a lecture. Um, but I will be holding the worship term next month, and um, I have several things going inside of me. One is uh, um, that this is a way for whites to avoid the conversation. Another part of me is uh, realizing that the only way to help anyone move forward is to take them where they're at and move the next step. Um, and I realize that we're also talking about uh, the structural racism is really is an economic system that keeps us all um, down. And so I can see some connection with class. I can feel it myself. But I also feel like it's because I've been able to see that and not really look at the racism. Um, so any ideas about moving forward, I'd really welcome. Mm -hmm. So I say, I mean, one is just to be able to, you know, potentially again have like a one-on-one -on -one conversation with the person just to be like, you know, so tell me more about like what do you, you know, what, what does it mean to feel awful about class? And oftentimes for a lot of folks, they're really pissed off about economic injustice and they, they, they think that economic injustice and racial uh, justice are just like totally separate things. And so being able to just like, because you want someone pissed off about economic injustice. So that's great, you're pissed off about economic injustice. And so to understand how economic injustice operates in the United States, white supremacy has been fundamental to how the economic system has been developed in this country. And so you, to talk about class without race is to actually have a conversation that is not going to lead us towards economic justice. It's actually gonna lead us to more of a fractured working class, a fractured economic justice movement that is divided by race and actually makes us less powerful. So if you want to have a conversation about class, I invite you to participate and learn how white supremacy and white privilege has been used to organize class in this society. And here's a couple of books. One of them is a new one that just came out by David Gilbert called Looking at the White Working Class Historically. It just came out. Looking at the White Working Class Historically. The author is David Gilbert. It's a really fantastic piece about how race and class have, have been have developed together in the United States. Um, and then uh, Bell Hooks has a really fantastic um, book about class, which I believe in the title, Stand is in the title. Is anybody familiar with the title? I just remember it's a book, I just remember I can see the cover in my, in my head and it says class. I mean, but Google it. Yeah. Google <laughs> Bell Hooks. Google, there is yeah, Google. 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 Google Bell Hooks in class. And she's got a, and it's a bunch of really accessible essays, um, again, about the ways that race and class operate. And so again, just being able to say, you know what? I absolutely agree with you. We need to have economic justice in this country. We need to be able to understand class. And race is actually one of the ways that most white people are deeply confused about class. Yes. And keep white people confused. And so the book is called Where We Stand. So effective use of people right now. Yeah, where we stand, class matters. Bell hooks. Where we stand, class matters. And so, yes, class matters, and to understand how it matters, we need to understand how white supremacy has organized class in this society and pitted white working class and poor people against people of color. And so economic justice requires economic, re requires racial justice. Mm -hmm. Truth. All right, I think we have time for one more. You want to go ahead? Yeah, three. One, two. Or, or, right, we had three. One, one two, two three. Go ahead. All right, let's do the three, and then we'll yeah. do our closeout. So my question, um, the semi-question and some, somewhat of a, a comment. A lot of times when we talk about race, especially when like the Thanksgiving dinner scenario comes up, there's always like an older person. Um, but I've come in and out of progressive spaces for years and years, and sometimes I can't take it, and I'll go take a job in corporate America. Um, because <laughs> There's a, a self-mythologizing thing around youth and race, mm -hmm. and I'm not, unfortunately, seeing as much progress as I would like to see when I start working with a lot of younger people. Mm -hmm. um, so can you kind of talk about unpacking kind of the age stereotypes around race? Um, definitely. Um, I think that we want to believe that the young, as we, the younger generation comes up, that we have less and less race issues. But the reality is that you know they've actually done studies where millennials are as racist as anybody else. Um, and I don't know why we would think that would happen because if you're getting raised by parents 
who were raised to be racist, how could you not be racist, right? Um, and so I think that there's a desire to think that racism and white supremacy will just get undone somehow, some way, <laughs> magically, because we get younger. We've been getting younger for 400 years and it hasn't <laughs> happened, right? And so I don't, so I, I, I think that it doesn't matter, like there's no magic trick. Like young people aren't any less racist. Some of them may have more experience with diversity because they've been in more diverse environments. Diverse environments doesn't, still doesn't make you not racist because anti-racist is an intentional conscious choice. And until you've made it, it's sort of like, I was, you know, my family, I was born in a Catholic family. My family's from Haiti. So when you're born, you get baptized right away, right? Because it's not your, they don't believe it's your choice. We're gonna save you, right? In a Baptist church, you have to make an intentional commitment when you get older and you are of sound mind, whatever age that is, that you want to accept Christ as your savior, right? So that becomes an intention. And so to me, that's the difference, right? It's like, you know, anti-racism is a choice that you make. It's a lifestyle that you decide to ascribe to. You decide to self-educate. You decide to participate in a way that's going to interrupt the dominant narrative within you. So to me, the method, it, there's no, somehow we, we're not gonna eradicate this in with time. Time by itself will give you the same old crap. <laughs> <laughs> But right now, in the national midwife movement, there's kind of a, another kind of cycle of reckoning with the whitewashing of our history and our, like the, the, you know, kind of white hippie midwives in the 60s saving midwifery, you know, from the clutches of death of the granny midwives in the South and other places, and at the same time, you know, just abhorrent racial health disparities in this country and trying to look at things and. And one of this, I was at this conference back a couple weeks ago, but you know, it's been one of those like eight thousand comments on Facebook threads about um, things. And really, I really appreciate a lot from tonight that I'm going to bring to that to those discussions. Um, but one of the issues that I've been struggling with trying to articulate, because you know, as we all know, like there's a lot of limitations in Facebook conversations, is you know, there's been a lot of like often around the age of two, like, oh, these, you know, young people's tactics, and like, you know, it's related to, like, to the NFL stuff, right? Like, there's the people of color saying what they need, saying what needs to change, like, there's not ever, like, no, no kind of tactic is appropriate, you know, so at this conference, people got up and kind of took over the stage and called people out to say, like, leadership, like, what are you going to change, how are you going to disrupt, and so, you know, when you were just saying, Chris, about the, the spectrum and like who you can try to move and who you, you know, just like, I feel like that really spoke to me because I feel like a lot of what's happening in our movement right now is trying to say like, like there's people that it's not going to move, but do you have people hear that? But I guess what I'm asking is around like how to respond when to that piece around like, you know, people not recognizing that there's always in any movement like a spectrum of tactics and where people fall, like you were saying, a spectrum of white folks, and it's also, you spoke a little bit of like, in your 20s, you were like, fuck white people, I'm not gonna work, you know, I'm not, it's not my work, and now you're saying that is some of your work, but I don't have a super articulated question other than like, I feel like it's like people either are engaging or they're just totally shutting down, and and a lot of it's around like, kind of seeing that these tactics are too radical or too in your face, you know, and just thoughts on how to respond, especially in a social media platform because we are so dispersed, um, of like maybe key messages that can speak to the people who are willing to be moved as opposed to just turning people off. Interesting. Um, in Dr. King's letter to a Birmingham jail, he talks about the white modern being the biggest obstacle to civil rights. Right. Hey, I have to see publish that first. Yes. Just want to do a shout. Right. <laughs> there you go. We did other things that weren't so good, but we did that. <laughs> um, and and when I think about that, you know, and I've, I've I've encountered this, like you know, when we're 
trying to figure out different ways of organizing, and you get the person who goes, that's too radical, we can't do that, right? Usually you've hit a place where they aren't, they haven't been able to unpack yet, right? Mm -hmm. Because the reality is that um, there's a lot of criticism of tactics. It's sort of like what we've seen with Colin Kaepernick, right? Oh, you can't kneel. Well, first he was sitting, well, you can't sit. Well, then you're kneeling in a sign of respect. Well, you can't kneel, right? Well, what can you do to protest black people being murdered by the police? And why can't you do it in a place that disrupts other people? Because isn't that the point of protesting, is to disrupt, right? And to make you feel uncomfortable, and to make you wrestle with, why is this happening? I mean, everything he tried to do with that protest has worked. It's actually worked. It's one of the best protests I've ever seen because he doesn't have to keep doing it and it's still having an impact. And it's making people have to fight with it. And so, you know, you know, I just say that like when you recognize when people bring those things up, that you they've hit some some inner wall. And that should tell you you're going in the right direction. Mm. Yeah. Because if you've hit that wall of sheer discomfort where they want to tell you you're too radical, then you're doing something right. Mm. That's right. Mm. Mm. There was one more person. And then we're going to close. I just wanted to um, go back uh, and agree with one of the first things you said to uh, at the very beginning of the meeting about how in a very weird way in this time um, we've got a huge opportunity to organize against racism uh, in, in the Trump era. And I think that there's an opening in a lot of people that people are really excited to do this work and interested to do it. I, I work in, I, I'm a pastor out in Bryn Mawr and work in Macau Metro. Uh, and uh, we, we had a meeting last Monday, anti-racism discussion I invited Reverend Holston, who's the executive director, and uh, Reverend Robin Hynek, who's the pastor down here at Broad Street, to come and talk about what they've been doing at Phil. And they, um, you know, they gave a really great talk about anti-racism work in Philly. And then um, halfway through, Reverend Holston said, now I want everybody in here to sign up to do something about racism. And, and we hadn't even done it sign-in sheet. So we start passing out a sheet, and Robin Heineke, as the sheet goes around, he starts saying, now you know, this is a lifetime job. This is a lifetime commitment. And people are, the person holding the paper at that moment is going, I don't know if I can sign this piece of paper. I've given away my life to do this work. And, and passed it on to the next person. You know, then there became this discussion for a little while about, you know, people trying to decide whether they could make a lifelong commitment and sign into the meeting or, you know, and what, what that was about. So it got to the end of the meeting, the paper's still going around, and, uh, and it just was getting late. One guy raised his hand, and I said, I said okay, we got to end the meeting, last comment. And he, bless his heart, he said, I grew up in Mississippi. I learned, he was a white guy, he said, I learned racism every day the first 19 years of my life. So I figure I owe it to the, to do the next 19 years unlearning it and doing something about it. That was amazing. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Well, just real quick, can somebody, with my Google friend, Google Jennifer Harvey? Jennifer Harvey, so back to this youth question. So people, so uh, an amazing radical Christian uh, wrote a book called Raising, uh, Raising Race, I can't remember exactly the title, we're gonna get it here. Jennifer Harvey, that's about anti-racist parenting for white parents with white children. So going back to this, like, you know, you know the youth and young people, I think part of it is, again, Michelle Alexander said, what would have happened if after Brown versus Board of Education, 
thousands and thousands of white people realized, realized they needed to do preparation work to support white communities to integrate. Mm. Not just support black communities to fight segregation, but to support white communities and white youth and white children to prepare for integration and see it as part of a better future for them. As opposed to just being like, we're well, all those white people against it are just a bunch of racists and we're gonna write them off. And so being able to support and prepare. So this book about white anti-racist parenting is just about to come out. And for the midwives, I mean, you all are in a perfect position to talk about, hey, when there's a disruption going on and when people are seriously uncomfortable, what do we tell the people who are giving birth? You yeah. keep pushing. Yeah, you keep pushing, you breathe yeah. and you push. <laughs> so encouraging all the people who are pushing, thanking them, loving them, encouraging them to do more, and sharing your own story about why this has been such a powerful learning for you that validates the leadership of those stepping up and using your own personal experience to help bring other people into it. Yeah, I think that um, there are two stories that sort of resonate with me. One is Valerie Poor's yeah. question of are we in the um, darkness of the tomb or the darkness of the womb? Yes. Um, and Dr. William Barber's um, uh, at the DNC in 2016 when he said America's on life support and it's up to us to be the defibrillator that awakens it. Um, and when I think about that, that's really sort of at the heart of what this moment is about and what we're called to do, is that if you really believe that this is the darkness of the womb, then this is a moment of opportunity. All the work that happens inside in the darkness for a fetus to become full size, to be able to come out into the real world, we're sort of preparing America to be great because it's never been great yet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> only we yeah, that's, that's right, the only way is through. So we're, we have a closing. Thank you so much. If you can thank you. And, and thank you all for being here and for like being in this conversation and for Signing that paper for life um, really, um, really matters. It really matters. Um, and I wanted to do a shout out tomorrow. Chris is going to be doing a four hour workshop on organizing for racial justice at Arch Street Meeting. Um, um, and we still have room. So if you want more, come on out to this workshop tomorrow. So, but we have a song and a chat. Where's the lyrics? Yeah, you want to pass out? Yeah, pass out. Yeah, let's pass out the lyrics. Are you going to help the lyrics? Oh, do you want to help? Well, I'll, I'll help pass the, pass out the lyrics. <laughs> oh, now you're going to cop out. You just said you were going to sing. I love singing. I'm okay. singing. Thank you. Can I take a moment? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we, we actually wanted to close out with this song because we believe that like music is how we build community and so um, you know we thought this was a powerful song for movement building and for creating uh, beloved community. So bear with us with that. Here you want. No, you no, need no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> that. All the song come, come, come on, come on up. We have some song leaders here. We need some song leaders, yes. Okay, you ready? Ready. Oh, look at you. No, no one can. <laughs> Broken down and tired. Uh, living life on the merry-go-round. And you can't find the fire.
so we're gonna do the Asada Shakur pledge, and Chris is gonna talk a little bit about it. I think afterwards or first. I think before. Before. Yeah. Why don't you talk about it before? Yeah. I'm gonna tell you. you explain what it, you want, um, so you the Asada pledge is sort of a pledge that we take um, in the movement to commit ourselves to the work, um, and it starts. Um, it is our duty to fight for our freedom. It is our duty to win. We must love and protect each other. We've got nothing to lose but our chains. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what did you call the name of the pledge? Um, it's the Asada Shakur Pledge. And so the first time I heard this pledge was uh, shortly after September 11th of 2001. And it was led by uh, black liberation leaders in the San Francisco Bay Area. And I remember standing there as one of the few white people of all these people of color being led by, by queer black women in making this chant. And I remember this deeply uncomfortable feeling of being like, should I even be saying this chant as a white person? What does that mean that I have nothing to lose but my chant? And so as we do this, I want to invite those of you who've been raised white, those of you who might come from wealth, those of you who have different forms of privilege connected to this system, to think about what we've been talking about all night in terms of this being about a liberation movement for all of us to get free. And also to get awkward. So if it feels awkward to do this chant, it's an opening up of a place to work towards getting more free. So embrace the chant and the awkwardness that might come with it. Great, so I'm gonna ask you to stand. I'm gonna ask you to put up one fist and to follow after me. It is our duty to fight for our freedom. It is our duty to fight for our freedom. It is our duty to win. It is our duty to win. We must love and support each other. We must love and support each other. We've got nothing to lose but our chains. We've got nothing to lose but our chains. It is our duty to fight for our freedom. It is our duty to fight for our freedom. It is 